And I'll start the recording. Um, okay, welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, today we've got uh, Prince Nalbani. He's going to be talking to us about his uh, project, which is about to start. Uh, he's working with Alessandro Colasanti, and he's going to be. And the project is all about measuring hippocampal pathology in patients with multiple sclerosis and depression. So, over to you, Prince. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as Chris said, I'm, I'm Prince. I, I'm a clinical research fellow um, at the Clinical Imaging Sciences Center. Um, as part of the remit of my fellowship, I am also carrying out a PhD research um, on this topic, on the topic you can see before you, quite a, quite a very long and uh, daunting uh, title. But what I intend to do now is just to try and break it down a bit and tell you a bit about where I am with, with the project. And I, I do have this style of presentation where I initially chat a bit freely so that you know I can carry everyone along. It, it, it's quite it's much more easier when you do that. So I'll, I'll just chat freely about what I'm doing about, about the entire project. And then I'll begin to navigate the slides and then you can, you know, have a good idea of, of, of the entire project. So, I mean, it's, it's no longer on common knowledge about the link between depression and uh, inflammation. In fact, since 2005, there have been several high impact articles uh, in very uh, high impact journals, you know, talking about this link. Multiple sclerosis on its own is uh, a neuroinflammatory condition affecting the central nervous system. That's the brain and the spinal cord. It affects, in terms of epidemiology, it affects about uh, 2.5 million people globally. And in the UK alone, affects over 100,000. That's, that's quite a lot. Um, there has been robust research evidence that shows a very high prevalence of uh, depression in multiple sclerosis. In terms of figures, uh, a lifetime prevalence of about 50% and an annual prevalence of 25%. In research terms, in terms of prevalence, that's quite high. The question then arises, why? Why is there such uh, a high prevalence? If you, take, uh, if you take multiple sclerosis as a chronic inflammatory condition and stack it against other chronic inflammatory conditions, maybe like rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease or even affecting the brain, you find that Depression is still quite high. There have been studies, uh, Patton, uh, Maria, these are very well-known figures in, in such research. The, the prevalence of depression is, is much higher in, in multiple sclerosis. So, so it's a valid question, why? Now, if, we want, if you want to answer that question, is it solely as a result of the psychological impact of functional disability that is well-known with you know, such a chronic debilitating condition? or is there more to it? And research evidence shows, or research evidence tells us or suggests that there are other biological factors at play. There lies the basis of my PhD. What are these factors? Good. Once you look at the brain, which, which structure is, would be a suitable candidate you know, to explain this link? It would have to be one that is quite vulnerable to the effects of neuro neuroinflammation. It would also have to be one that has, in terms of its function, that has um, a lot of relevance in, you know, in our emotions or how we feel, or even in our actions. And that organ is the hippocampus, or that structure is the hippocampus. So, my PhD is centered around looking at the hippocampus. 
But the hippocampus is quite unique as a structure. It is very much embedded in the mediotemporal lobes, you know, and it's uh, made up of several subregions and subfields that are stacked upon each other in a very histologically unique way. These subregions are really small. So that if you employ traditional methods or conventional methods, you know, if that's an MRI, you would mostly get, uh, you would mostly be able to talk a bit about the volume and maybe things that have to do with the atrophy. What my PhD is looking into are uh, very novel techniques, some of which have been designed here in the Clinical Imaging Sciences Center that will look at this sub compartments in detail, that will be able to, sensitive enough to look at micro alterations in hippocampal pathology, as well as quantify oxidative metabolism. And as we go on, you will see a bit more of this. Not only that, we are also going to, um, so we're going to try to differentiate uh, hippocampal pathology in people who have multiple sclerosis, you know, differentiate them from those who don't. And people who have comorbid multiple sclerosis and depression from those who have only multiple sclerosis. We will also, in a longitudinal fashion, want to see the effects of this, what, what we refer to as disease-modifying treatments. These are the, some of the uh, new medications that they use to try and, I, it, it doesn't have a cure, but to try and control the processes that occur in, in multiple sclerosis, so the relapse or, or, or demyelination. So let me, I, I hope by doing that, you have an idea of what I'm going to uh, speak about. Um, so I'll just going to go, get onto my. Sorry, I don't, I'm, I'm not able to get onto the next slide. Just try pressing the space bar or the right arrow key. That's what, that's what I did, but it's not, uh, it doesn't seem to be working for some reason. Maybe press escape and see if there's something. It isn't working either, that's strange. Oh, okay, it's working now. Uh, I'll have to do this. Oh, it's gone back. <laughs> oh no, it keeps going back. It's probably that your open window is showing the show and that's what you're, sh well, maybe not sharing. And then you've, you've got this open in PowerPoint. You've got sort of a, a window for the presentation open and your PowerPoint. I mean, you can just show it like this and we can see what's on your slides. Okay, maybe I'll just show it like this. Oh, okay. Okay, so in terms of an outline, I will, um, I mean, I've touched on a few of these things in my introduction. So I would look at it, uh, the, the hippocampus in, in my background as a potential candidate in the etiopathology of depression associated to MS. The rationale being, Traditional imaging of the hippocampus is unable to visualize hippocampal neuroinflammation, like I said. So we've developed some novel techniques, as, um, some of which have been developed here at CISC, um, in order to carry out high resolution diffusion imaging of the hippocampus. And some other additional techniques, MRI techniques, where we can um, focus on you know, mapping um, oxidati oxidative metabolism um, you know, that is occurring in the hippocampal pathology. With the, with the pandemic, I've been really busy. I, I haven't stopped. Um, I mean, there was, it was, it, it put a down on um, recruitment. But what I did was I went on to the uh, human, human connectome project, which 
is uh, is um, a, a combination of uh, data that has been, um, I think it, it emanated from the Massachusetts uh, General Hospital. It's data there, uh, diffusion data, you know, for anyone who wants to try and answer pressing problems that have to do with uh, diffusion. So I've been analyzing some data from there for healthy controls, and I'll show you a bit of that as well. Um, the aim being, the aim being to apply it to uh, MS depression data when I begin to recruit MS patients. So the sole aim, the sole aim of this uh, PhD or, or the project is to characterize multimodal high resolution imaging of the hippocampus in healthy volunteers and in MS patients. And this is how I will proceed with, with my slides. I will tell you, for those who don't really know much about MS, um, I'll tell you a bit about MS in a, in a nutshell very quickly. I will also talk about the role of the hippocampus in cognition and affective regulation. And then we will go on to alteration of the hippocampal volume during stress and mood disorder. So what the effects that stress and affective problems um, would have on, on the hippocampus. Um, vulnerability of the hippocampus to neuroinflammation and oxidative stress as evidenced by demyelination in MS. And then we will then move on to diffusion imaging of the hippocampus and in experimental MS. So we'll try and compare some of these diffusion modalities, but in EAE mice, that's experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis mice, which is just an animal model for multiple sclerosis. I'll then tell you a bit about my PhD, just a snapshot and a few background slides. Then I'll tell you about some of the analysis that I've done uh, with the Human Connectome Project as well. And, and we'll close there. Okay, um, so MS in a nutshell. I hope everyone can see these slides. There are a few small prints, but don't worry about the prints. I'll just tell you what I have here on the slide. MS as a condition is a chronic debil debilitating neuroinflammatory autoimmune condition that affects the brain and the spinal cord with sensory, motor, visual, um, and affective consequences. Um, with MS, what happens is that, I mean, there's still loads of research, but what happens is that there's the belief that the blood-brain barrier is somewhat leaky or is defective. So immune cells cross the blood-brain barrier, T cells most likely, and then begin to have an impact. If you can see my cursor, so it, it begins to destroy the myelin sheet that protects the, the neural axons and um, also destroy the um, oligodendrocytes that, that produce this myelin sheet. What happens is that there is a disruption in uh, neurotransmission across the, the axons, and this can lead to all sorts of problems, it can affect cognition. So you, you hear the MS patients, uh, bless them, unfortunately, they tend to have this brain fog, problems with their memory. They have problems with vision um, because it affects the optic nerve. You know, they say they have um, double vision or some of them complain of what we call nystagmus and their vision is quite bad. Some of them might also be quite dizzy. Fatigue is quite, quite big on, in, in, in multiple sclerosis. I think about 85 to 90% patients complain of fatigue. Uh, they do a bit of work, maybe their activities of daily living, they just do a bit and then they get really tired. You know, really uh, the, the energy levels reduce quite dramatically. It could, not every time, but it could affect uh, speech, swallowing. So some, some patients complain of speech and swallowing difficulties and that's fatigue, which I've spoken about. Some patients complain about pain. Uh, I've seen patients with in, in a lot of pain. 
sometimes at night, the pain is worse. They have this spasm. So their, their muscles begin to spasm at night, keep them awake at night. So it causes some insomnia as well. They don't sleep very well. If the condition continues to advance, it might begin to affect the bladder and the bowel. So you hear patients complaining about incontinence and problems of the sort. Patients also complain about sexual dysfunction. Some patients complain about tremor, there's tingling, weakness, loss of balance. So uh, patients will tend to pr uh, present to their GPs first. Um, if the GP has a high in the, if they suspect, you know, then they refer to the neurologist. I mean, I haven't, I haven't sat in, um, my, my profession is in psychiatry, so I haven't really sat in on, on the neurological, um, I mean, when they are seen, but what I, what I think is if, if there are problems with vision and problems with balance and the neurologist begins to think about, uh, after several examinations and of course um, investigations to show that the patient has multiple sclerosis, they start to think of disease modifying agents. Uh, those are the medications. So there is numbness there as well. Now in terms of phases, multiple sclerosis presents in different phases. High up there in 85% of, of patients is the relapsing remitting. So the, the relapsing remitting phase of uh, multiple sclerosis, where there's an acute attack of multiple sclerosis, um, should last for a period of more than 24 hours. And, and then um, after a couple of weeks, or it could be months, then, there, then there's a, a, a remission. So that, and, and, and with this remission, so you can, you can see it in this graph, with, with the remission, so when they become stable, it might be full or it might be partial. Most times it's partial. What is happening are, are the lesions that are occurring within the brain. And they, so there's demyelination and there's remyelination. But in the remyelination process, it might, it might not be full, it might be partial. And that's why it's so chronic and debilitating because even when, they, even when the patient has that relief, it, it, it's not full. They still feel the, some of these problems, you know, as time goes on. So that's the relapsing and re, re, remitting. What the prognosis, what is expected is that after about eight to 20 years, then it goes on to the secondary progressive, which is a more, um, it's, the, the attacks are, are quite more often than um, the, the, uh, remissions are, are not really there. So you can see here that you have a re remitting and um, relapsing uh, aspect, and then you just have this gradually progressive aspect that occurs. And that's the secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Now in between, in about 15% 15, 15 of patients, they complain about a primary progressive phase. So this is a phase that doesn't have the re relapsing remitting um, aspect, and it's just the gradually progressive phase that occurs. It's, it's somewhat rare. I've been attending multiple sclerosis focus groups since I began my PhD, which is roughly more than a year ago now, and I haven't still seen, no, I, I think as I might have seen one or two, but not as much as the uh, relapsing remitting. And then the medications they use for the relapsing remitting, I've noticed are different from um, from the ones they use for the primary progressive. Then rarer still, very much rare is the um, progressive relapse in multiple sclerosis. I haven't, I have never seen, I haven't seen a case of this. I think it's superimposed uh, relapses on, on a progressive pattern. I think that's what's happening here. So that's multiple sclerosis in a nutshell. In terms of diagnosis, um, they use the terms dissemination in space and dissemination in time. So is, are the lesions occurring at different aspects of the central nervous system? And are they, occur, are they also occurring at different times? And then there's a high index of suspicion. And the neurologist does several investigations like, uh, uh, of course, a scan 
I'm either using a contrast or not. And um, uh, they look into the CSF as, as well, find immunoglobulins, local clonal bodies, and then they start thinking, yes, this person has multiple sclerosis. And then they give the diagnosis and then they start to think about treatment as well. Um, I'll just move on to the next slide. So just to emphasize on how big a problem it is to both psychiatry and, and neurology, I, I uh, uh, picked uh, two vignettes, two clinical vignettes. Um, as part of the remit of my fellowship, I am also strategically placed because I'm a higher specialist trainee in psychiatry, I'm, I'm placed in a very unique clinic that is called the Immunopsychiatry Clinic. And it's a second opinion clinic. Um, what happens is that the community teams, uh, when they want a second opinion, when they have comorbid conditions, so there's an inflammatory component to the psychological problem that patient has, and they might seek a second opinion and they may make a referral to the immunopsychiatry clinic. It has certain criteria the patient must, miss, uh, must meet before we accept them. Um, I, I was strategically pleased there because there's uh, the thinking, of course, that I would be able to recruit uh, from that clinic as well. Um, it's, it's a clinic that, that has been run by the Sussex Partnership NHS Trust. And I, I've, come across, I've come across quite a couple of patients, quite a lot of patients with comorbid inflammatory and psychological problems. Um, um, in fact, one of the psychologists there is about to release, a, uh, we're about to publish a paper, which I'm also involved with on, on this comorbidity. Um, I've seen patients with rheumatoid arthritis, Berche syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease. It's, it's a very unique clinic and I'm quite glad I'm within that clinic. I'll just tell you about these two patients. Um, there was a referral of patient X, was for confidential reasons. Um, it, she was a 48 year old female Caucasian and she presented with depression, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, and anxiety. When we looked into our history, we found that, no, before we looked into our history, there was comorbid, we had been informed that she had a comorbid diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And when we looked into our history, what we found was that some of the problems that she might have been having, which we had, I think, deemed to have been, to have come from uh, psychological issues, actually had a bit to do with uh, perhaps one or two of the uh, remis uh, relapses that she was having from multiple sclerosis. So that we feel that her multiple sclerosis might have been diagnosed quite late because she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in her early forties, I think. And we felt that her multiple sclerosis had, had actually started from, uh, had happened when she was a teenager, just by some of the uh, symptoms she, she, you know, she gave to us. So in our recommendations, we felt that multiple sclerosis had a lot to do with her presentation. Her presentation was quite unique. She used to, um, she had this recurrent depressive episodes and she would not want to eat, not want to drink. She would not want to get out of bed. Um, she would, um, there's, there's what we refer to as psychomotor retardation. So she will almost grant to a halt, a sort of melancholic like presentation, so much so that it will take intervention from neighbors, you know, to bring services, you know, to, to intervene. Um, so that's, that was one of them. I mean, with her, we are trying to get her to see the, uh, to see the neurologist again because her problem was that she declined a disease modifying agents for, for, uh, for some personal reasons. So we're trying to get her to, of course, we have to have her on board, you know, to have these medications because we, be, we, we believe that these medications can really uh, have an effect on the lesions occurring within the brain, as well as secondarily help 
with uh, the psychological aspects that you know that she's having. So the second patient was a 40-year-old Caucasian male, <clears throat> right? Um, quite an intelligent fellow. Um, um, the referral had to do with, you know, it happened so acute. What we had in the referral was that um, this individual, all of a sudden, he's married and has an 18-month-old child. All of a sudden became quite um, disturbed by certain noise frequencies. So that was how the, the referral came. Um, <clears throat> so much so that they had had to, the family had had to move, I think, on two occasions. And, and this happened all of a sudden. Of course, in the history, uh, it said that he had a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis when he was 18. He hadn't had, he, he's not had uh, too many um, uh, relapses. You know, he's, he's been in remission for quite some time, which is something you might see with multiple sclerosis as well. Or, or it could that he's had very subtle symptoms and no one has actually picked that up. What was interesting and why I put it here <clears throat> was that when, as we investigated further, we found that there's a, there's a uh, condition known as hyperacusis. Hyperacusis could occur with multiple sclerosis and it's, uh, um, it's when one becomes really uncomfortable with certain noise frequencies, certain sounds. Um, and it, it could happen in multiple sclerosis because the vestibular cochlear nerve enters into the brainstem at the level of the pons and the medulla. And if there are lesions around there, which could occur in multiple sclerosis, it could damage the vestibular cochlear nerve. So what we did was we sent him for an audiology evaluation and we're still waiting to hear back from that. So what they would do is that they would characterize this discomfort try to pin it down to, to, to the, uh, you know, the, the noise frequencies, and then we, you know, we, we will get copied into the results and then we'll go on from there. So these are just some of the problems that could occur in uh, multiple sclerosis. Of course, he had, in addition, he had depression and, and anxiety, okay? So I think I have to move a bit faster now. Um, this is what the hippocampus looks like. It has that uh, seahorse appearance. Um, this, this is just a labeled uh, diagram of the hippocampus. Fimbre, there are some very important ana uh, anatomical landmarks here. Like the fimbria is really important. You'd see later on as I, as I navigate my slides. Um, the choroid plexus. The dentate is also quite important. Um, the gyrus is quite important. It's one of the uh, subregions of the hippocampus. And there's the sulcus. Um, when I worked in the memory clinic, when you have an, enlar an enlarged sulcus, you begin to think about conditions like um, Alzheimer's. There's the subiculum, temporal horn, you know, and you can see the rest. Um, I'll go on to the next slide. Let me just go on to that other slide. So the title of that slide was Rule of the Hippocampus in Cognition and Affective Regulation. The hippocampus is quite, it's very important in cognition. Next slide. The next slide will look at um, the connections, some of the connections to areas of the brain that, um, are quite relevant in the regu regulation of our emotions, our affect, and our feelings. So the phonics is really very important. You know, if I had played around with uh, my, my slides, I could have pressed play there and then you, you would have seen some movement here, but I don't know, I could, I, it just wouldn't work. But I'll, I'll just quickly tell you, you can see the connections. Well, um, the phonics is really important as a landmark. The, uh, there are certain structures. So when you come anteriorly, you can see the alveolus and the alveolus will go on to the fimbri. The fimbri is like a rubbery structure and forms the uh, fringe of the hippocampus. 
The fimbri then gives rise to the crura. I understand crura in Latin means legs. And adicrura, when they unite, is a point where information can go from one hippocampus to the other. Um, then there are the commissures. Before the phonix goes to the commissures, it gives rise to fibers. And it also gives rise to the uh, gives rise to fibers at the level of the phonix as well. And these fibers, as you can see, uh, you know, feed into the anterior nuclei of the thalamus, the cingulate cortex, the mammillary bodies, the amygdala. So you can see all these connections and all these areas uh, in neuroanatomy and anatomy are quite relevant in the uh, regulation of our emotions and our affect. And that is why the hippocampus is quite, uh, is an organ that is really very uh, important in cognition as well as emotional regulation. I'll move on to the next slide, which shows the, some of the subregions of the, the important subregions. And some of these subregions we are quite um, interested in. So you can see the hippocampus here now, but with, with the subregions. So there's CF. Now these subregions, they're called the conuamonus. Conuamonus, CA. So they, you have CA1 to CA4. I think it's called conuamonus. Um, goes back in history to the Egyptian god that is called Amon. And then Kono means horn. So horn of that god uh, is called Amon. Kono Amonus. So you have CA1 to CA4. You have CA1 here, which is really very relevant. And we're looking at CA1. It's quite relevant in, in this research. Um, there's CA2 and CA3 here. Some regions you can't really denulate. You can't really separate. Uh, them from each other. So CA2 and CA3 are mostly um, in many literature are, are taken as you know one region. And then there's the dentate gyrus, which is quite important. It has a molecular layer. And then there's CA4 as the subiculum, um, thing as the parasubiculum, and then the entorhinal cortex. So you can see how each region is just stacked upon each other in a very unique and um, in, in imaging terms, in a very, it's quite difficult to, to visualize this, these regions, um, but with some of the novel techniques, we intend to do just that. And this is just like uh, yeah, another diagram. I'll go on to the next slide, which in this slide, why I put this slide in is because we then begin to uh, see the usefulness of, of some of these regions. And some literature have begun to uh, look at the volumes of these regions, like some sort of volumetric analysis. Um, this is, this uh, slide or this uh, diagram is from Zeng et al. What uh, Zeng did here and his working group, what they did was that they took a cohort and divided them into four groups based on age. So there's the younger age group. Um, I can't really remember the figures now. I think from 26 to 35, there was the middle early from 35, I think up to about 50. And then there was the middle late, that's from 50 to 60 something. And then 60 something upwards were the older uh, bits of the cohort. And, um, they used a software, free software. Free software is just like an imaging software package that has computed programs in it uh, and is very efficient in volume. Well, I would, some literature have argued otherwise anyway, because some of, some, actually I saw some literature that, that are questioning the validity of free software, but everyone knows it to be quite good in uh, volumetric analysis and in shape analysis. What I, I have, what free, free software can do an automate, automated, like a semi-automated or an automated segmentation. And that's what they've done here. You can see it's all color coded, very nicely done. There's CA1 there, the sub-region. There's CA2, CA3 in green there. So that's a sagittal view. This is a coronal view and that's an Excel view. And it's so neat. 
I'm emphasizing on the neatness because I've done my own segmentation manually and it's not as neat as that, but at least I take solace in the fact that some literature are arguing that um, some of these automated means are not very um, effective and that manual segmentation should be the gold standard. You'll see later towards the end of my presentation, some of the things I've done. So what Zeng did was uh, look at these regions, um, do the volumetric analysis, uh, get the volumes. And what he found, or what they found, was that the volumes were very much reduced in the, in the older um, age groups. So the volumes of those of some of the sub-regions, I think CA1, CA2, CA3, were quite reduced in some of the old groups. And of course, that, that was um, somewhat significant. I will move on to the next slide, which I've titled this slide, Alteration of Hippocampal Volume During Stress and Mood Disorder. So we are, we are slowly moving from physiology down, and we're coming now to a bit of pathology. Now, this is some work that was carried out um, by Skamal et al. So Skamal and his working group, what they did was they, they did a correlation of uh, um, some research from the Enigma group. The Enigma, the Enigma group is quite a unique group, fantastic group, a very large uh, international collaboration um, that uh, cuts across about 14 countries. And um, I, I mean, between them, they have like 50 research samples. And in terms of power, because most literature you would find, you would see that both uh, healthy controls and, and uh, maybe MS patients, they're always in quite small figures. So you might have 1920s. But with the Enigma group, based on that, and pulling together all this data across their partners, they had a massive uh, sample. I think, I think uh, I, I can't remember the figures, but it was quite large. So in terms of power, you know, they had something quite significant. Um, what they wanted to do was that they looked at several subcortical regions in the brain, um, and they wanted to see which one of those regions can effectively differentiate between um, uh, um, major patients that suffer with major, major depression and then and, and controls. And they used the, the uh, OND effect size. OND effect size is just a statistical term. It differentiates between two standardized uh, means. Um, and it, it will follow things like a meta-analysis, like in this, in this study, it was, I think it was a meta-analysis. It will follow recognized uh, statistical methods like a meta-analysis uh, meta or ANCOVA or something like that. And you can see, you can see here, just look, look Look at the hippocampus. The, 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 the change was, was quite dramatic, you know, compared to other sub, subcortical regions, there was, was quite a marked reduction in, in volume according to the uh, OND effect, effect size. That's when you compare it to other subcortical regions. I mean, it was only closely rivaled by the amygdala. And there have, there have been some questions as well as, as of the relevance of the amygdala. But even in my previous slides, you can see that the hippocampus does connect quite, uh, quite well to the amygdala. So, you know, so the, this, was, this was quite clear and, and, and the, the power of this research was also uh, quite effective. Um, I will then go on to the next slide a bit faster. Um, this was work by Stefan Gold. Gold is a known name in in uh, affective disorders and, and uh, associated with multiple sclerosis. What he did um, was he used a procedure that is known as surface mesh modeling. Surface mesh modeling is a 3D computer graphics that will collect, for an object, will collect things like the vertices, the edges, the faces, in order to properly define you know, the shape of an object, something like that. I, I don't know if I've explained it that well. Um, 
So they got, he got a cohort, they got a cohort and divided this cohort into uh, people with high levels of depression and people with low levels of depression. And they were able to do this with the scale that is, that is called the CESD, the Center for Epidemiological uh, Studies Depression Scale, something like that. Um, and then if you score from zero to 20, you're placed in the low depression cohort. You score 21 and above, you're placed in the high depression cohort. What they found was that um, in the CA2s and CA3 subregions, and in parts of the subiculum, most especially, they didn't find anything on the left or in the right hippocampus. There were issues in, the, you know, there were, it was obvious they could see uh, some defects in the morphology. And that's what is represented here. I think these are just color, uh, color, color coded marks, I think. So that was, that, was, that was what was represented here and it was quite significant as well. Next slide is uh, my supervisor's work, Dr. Alessandro Colasanti, very, uh, very, very effective. And I think it's like the uh, primary uh, research behind uh, my PhD, to be honest. What he did was he simply looked at the inter uh, relationship between uh, hippocampal functional connectivity, depression, and neuroinflammation and found that there was a significant correlation. Um, depression, to, to, to look at, you know, to rate the symptoms, he used the, um, um, the Beck's depression invent inventory and the, uh, for functional connectivity, I think they used the uh, PET, PET CT, I think. And to, to get the volume of distribution of uh, uh, neuroinflammation, they, they use the protein lingand, uh, it's called TSPO. Um, what they found was that there was a, a very high correlation between those, those three factors. And it was quite significant to show that, uh, so you can see the linear regression there and it's functional connectivity to hippocampal TSPO, that's the protein binding and functional co connectivity to depressive symptoms. It was, it was quite significant in showing that, the, that hippocampal uh, neuroinflammation has quite a lot to do with, with uh, depression in MS patients. Um, the next slide it is work by uh, Getz. Um, it's, um, so we, we're now looking at, um, we've been, we've been, you know, we've gone from physiology, pathology, but now look, this, this is a post-mortem study. I think it was about, done for about 19 patients. Um, unfortunately, they had suffered quite badly with chronic uh, multiple sclerosis over a period of time, and then they had died, and then they taken their brains and, and stained, done some staining with histology. Um, what they, it, it was quite significant, it was quite marked because what they found was demyelination process, processes occurring mostly, mostly in the hippocampus in certain subregions. So you can see here, I think it was 15 out of 19, in fact. Uh, that was quite significant. So here, um, you can see the CA1 and I think CA2, CA3 up there. You can see that there's demyelination occurring uh, there. Um, this is just uh, a drawing, I think, just to show the subregions. And here as well, you can see a lot of demyelination, uh, some white matter even protruding. protruding. So there's, there's quite a couple of lesions, mixed lesions, single lesions, mostly mixed lesions. This, this research was, uh, was quite significant as well because they found that in those people, so they went through their data and found that in, 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 in uh, the sample, the ones who, have ha who had significant cognitive problems had quite a lot of mixed lesions. So intra and peri hippocampal lesions. And, and that's quite significant. That shows that the, uh, that the problems in MS in terms of cognition um, 
definitely do arise from lesions within the hippocampus. Okay, okay. next slide. This is, I put this slide in, in fact, I don't really know why I put the slide in, but it's, uh, I'm still trying to get my head around it, but it's, it, 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 it was a protocol that was designed by Tretz and her working group. So there, there've been a lot of issues with trying to, like I said, traditional methods of trying to view the hippocampus. And I think these issues are, uh, deal with certain imaging uh, technicalities, like the B value, the signal to the noise ratio, um, and some other, some other aspects. What TRIT, what TRIT has, has done here is uh, uh, use high resolution like methods, one times one times one, um, with, with a B value of about 500 and uh, um, a shorter acquisition time, think of about six minutes in order to try and effectively uh, view the hippocampus. It's, it's a paper that is worth looking at. I'm still looking at it myself. So, you know, if you're, if you're quite interested to see what she has done, and I think we have borrowed some of the things she's done within my project as well, in terms of the MRI physics and, and some of the uh, high resolution methods that we, we will be applying as soon as we begin to scan. Okay. Um, yep, I have about 12 minutes. Um, a bit about my PhD. Um, so where we, we intend to look at microstructural abnormalities, we intend to quantify oxidative metabolism using AS, ASE and R2, um, and then microstructural abnormalities by, with high resolution diffusion imaging. Um, some diffusion spectros, spectroscopy as well. Um, and then we're going to use quite a lot of skills. We're going to use the BDI to rate uh, depressive symptoms. We're going to use the mini, um, what's it called again? Uh, mini international neuropsychiatric interview to try and um, diagnose depression. And it, 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 it was, I mean, because of the number of skills, it, it arose during ethics. The, the ethics was trying to tell us that, well, in this, in this uh, PhD, you, you seem to want to, uh, to diagnose depression as well, even where where there was no suspicion of depression, some of your skills can pick up depression. And what would you do about that? And we had to, uh, it, it, I mean, our, our, our proposal came back and we had to like create a pathway for anyone who gets diagnosed during the, the research, for, you know, a very straightforward pathway for them to, uh, to get seen, you know, and, and to, to get the, the support that they need. Um, you, as, in the next slide, I think there's yeah a couple of couple of skills. There is the mini to com, uh, confirm diagnosis of major depressive episode. There's the BDI and Madras to rate the depressive symptoms, and then this this we were signposted towards this uh, skill, a very unique skill to try and assess cognition in patients. And we'll be using a lot of self-reported uh, questionnaires as well the fatigue severity skill, the EPSWOT sleepiness skill, the generalized anxiety uh, seven, and uh, which other one I think, yeah, that, that, that's about it. Um, in the next slide, just the schematics, how the entire process, you know, what the process involves. So I, I've already, I've got dates for uh, pre-screening. I started getting in healthy volunteers. There'll be a pre-screening process it could be done, it's going to be done over the phone or via email, if a couple of questions. And then I will also employ what, what is referred to as the emotional thermometer, you know, just to begin to get an indication of is this person, whether healthy or, or, or they have MS, are they, they tending towards depression or not? Um, and then the screening aspect, I'm really sorry about the small print, but you know, it's very self-explanatory. And the screening aspect is where we begin to employ um, most of our skills, you know, to see, you know, to rate symptoms and, and to get the diagnosis of depression if there is one. And then um, if they pass screening and they meet all the criteria we've set, some of the inclusion criteria put towards the end of, 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 of the slides, we then move on to MRI visits. Um, what happened, 
there's a longitudinal aspect of the, of the study. And what we intend to do is to get newly diagnosed patients that have had, that are newly diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and are waiting to start disease modifying treatments, about six of them, um, according to the MS Society, that are quite high impact. So we get them at that stage. Uh, of course, they have to give their consent. We have to tell them how important the research is and you know, they have to want to volunteer for it. We do the scanning before they start the disease modifying agents. And then four to six months after, we scan them again. Um, this is just like a time limit that I have left. And I'm beginning to you know, create a sequence so that I can move quite quickly. As I said before, COVID did uh, put it down on things, but I, I'm beginning to accelerate um, again, and hopefully I will meet uh, most of the targets. Um, I will rush over the next two slides. It's just some of the special MRI techniques that we would employ. So there's the um, arterial spin labeling. Arterial spin labeling is just radio label protons that, are there, that are in arterial blood, and then measure the time in which, so you, you, you do the radio labeling at this stage, and then you measure the time in which they go on to perfuse the brain tissue. So you have that, and then you do a control as well without radio labeled pr uh, protons. You then do a, some sort of subtraction and get a perfusion weighted image. And then it helps you to try and quantify or measure cerebral blood flow. Um, we'll be doing it as well as uh, ASC. So both together will give us a good indication of the measures of oxygen as we we'll try and map um, the amount of oxygen that, you know, that's been uh, utilized in, in the hippocampus. So that, as well as our high resolution imaging, we believe will tell us effectively in terms of micro alterations and in terms of oxidative metabolism, what exactly is happening in the hippocampus, in the brains, MS patients associated or with comorbid depression. Um, next slide is some of the work that I, I was doing during the lockdown. Um, I was still coming into the Clinical Imaging Sciences Center doing some work. I was analyzing data from the Human Connecting Project. I was given uh, some maps, some, some, some diffusion maps by my, sec uh, my secondary supervisor, Professor Mara Cecignani. Um, I was asked to play around with them a bit and then to, to find out which of the maps was the clearest. Um, of course, she had a, a big idea as well as my, as well as Dr. Colasanti as well. And we were brainstorming together. And then I found that the main B1000, that's what, that's what we named it, was, um, as you can see, Compared to the other, this is a coronal view. Compared to the others, it, it was this was the clearest. Um, I mean, if you strain your eyes a bit, you, you can even make out make out the hippocampus there on both sides, in the medial temporal lobes. Um, there, there, there was an aim to that. They, 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 they now we now began to uh, I now started to segment, and the segmented uh, segmentation was self-directed, I, um, I had to design or adapt uh, my own protocol from Marshall Dalton. Marshall Dalton is a, a, has a very, a very, very good uh, segmentation manual. You can look it up. I had to adapt a, a semi-protocol from that and then start to do self-guided manual segmentation with the aim being they're going to get someone else to do exactly what I've done to get some uh, inter uh, reproduce, reproduce it, to reproduce what I've done, to be honest. Um, I'm just trying to be, I'm trying to keep to time. So we, you can see some of my segmentation there, color coded CA1, uh, D, uh, DGCA4. Those are the, some of the regions we're interested in. So dented gyrus, CA4, CA1. And um, initially, I was interested in what a very small aspect, a layer called the SLRM, stratum, lacunosum, moleculare, and radiatum. But I later on, I've, I'm disposing of that idea because it's, it's, it's quite small. I'm not sure I'll be very 
um, effective with my with my results. So I, I I'm I've changed this now to CA two CA three, and and, I, and I'm going for that region as well because it, it is also quite an important region in in, a, in multiple sclerosis. Um, so that's some of my supplementation on MB one thousand, and from the sub regions we started to compute diffusion indices or diffusion parameters in, in terms of volumes, and you know this is the map. This is the volumes. These are the volumes. Um, from there, we also proceeded to using the server, the University of Sussex server, we, we went on to obtain Nodi maps as well from our, um, from our, the cohort that we got from the Human Connectome Project. And this is, these are what they look like. So this is the, um, um, I think this is the orientation, if I'm not, yeah, this is the intra intracellular uh, ICVF. And that's the OD and then that's the ISOVF. And these are the, uh, the indices or the parameters that we obtain from them as well. The aim being that we will compare these indices amongst the certain, uh, amongst the subregions in which they have been derived, probably do some statistical methods. If we do, uh, do um, ANCOVA, you know, to look at uh, the, to compare this, you know the the, indices, the the parameters we have, and uh, Spearman's correlation to do uh, a correlation uh, with with age and uh, hippocampal subvolume, just like what Zeng did. So I've divided the cohort we got from the Human Connection Project into groups as well, just similar to what Zeng did, but a bit more unique in that we haven't employed auto uh, automated methods. I'm, I'm doing everything somewhat manually. It is draining, it's time consuming, but um, it seems effective. Um, here is something quite special, which we're still working on. It's called Imaging Quality, quality Transfer. Uh, Professor Mara uh, uh, reached out to some of our colleagues in University College London, and I think they gave her some codes. And via the process of machine learning, we were able to um, you know, take uh, take um, information from highly built uh, systems and put them on our own data. So low re lower resolution, uh, resolution data. And that what it does it, that is that it, it kind of, uh, it makes it somewhat, it, it improves on the resolution, makes it, makes it clearer. So you, you can see these examples. This is the MB1000 that I've been, I've been using. And this is one that has undergone this image uh, quality transfer process. You can see how much clearer the hippocampal is there. And the effective thing about the image, image quality transfer is that when you zoom in to do the segmentation, you find when you zoom in the MB1000, you see how blurry that is. So it, did, it, it removes artifacts and it removes all the blurriness and you get something that is much more clearer. I can very much appreciate the hippocampus there. Um, I was, I don't want to exceed time, but these are uh, the criteria in which one has to meet, which one has to meet to get into the project. I've already talked about a few of them. So the MS patients, you have to be awaiting these medications, six of them, um, be within the, um, 18 and 80, have the diagnosis of either relapsing, remitting, or primary progressive. Those are the two aspects we're we are interested in. Uh, the EDSS, it, it's a scale that measures disability 5.5 or below. And of course, you're currently awaiting the DMT for the longitudinal aspect. And I think that's me. Um, this is, uh, you, you can find me on Twitter. If you want to learn more about things I'm doing uh, in, in the PhD, you know, you can find me on Twitter or, you know, you can send me an email or something, you know, I'll get back to you. Well, thank you very much, Prince. Um, I think given the time, there's probably not that much time for discussion, but I, I, I'm happy to leave the um, Zoom session up if, if anybody does have any, any um, discussion points that they want to chat to Prince about. But um, yeah, given the time, people may need to leave. So, um, Thank you very much, Prince.
It's a fascinating project and I look forward to hearing some results from it. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Um, cool. And uh, yeah, I will, uh, I will uh, make you the host of the thing if, if anybody would like to talk to you. Okay. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Chris. See you later. See ya.